Time to pull up a chair and talk some Dynasty football. I am your host, J.J. Wenner, and this is the Rider Dynasty podcast. Presented by Gridiron Ratings, your path to the title starts with Gridiron Ratings. Well, gentlemen, after a crazy draft last weekend, tonight we complete our post-draft rookie mock and find out who is on the move. Joining me, as always, Big Daddy Don Detweiler. How are you doing, Don? Dude, I'm doing wonderful. It's great. The draft was so interesting because just chaos ensued, and so many of the top guys went to interesting spots. We're going to get into that later, but the fallout is what makes it great. So here we go. Let's see what happens. Unfortunately, I slept through most of it, but <laughs> luckily you, I caught the recaps. Your boys did you proud. Thank you. And I caught the recaps from the host of the Fantasy Chop Shop. You know him. You tolerate him. You find him on Twitter at Ronnie A. Evans. Ron, what's going on? Not much. Uh, that that show was those multiple shows. We ended up it was almost three and a half hours, f- almost four hours of analysis on the rookie draft with Jeff DiMatteo and Jordan Vanek from Four for Four. And uh, this draft was like it stunk for landing spots pretty much across the board. Everyone was a lot more excited before the draft than after, but we're still excited for draft season and dynasty. And the truth is you get some steals now because people are tentative on these players. And in the end it's dynasty. So talent wins out. Absolutely. Also with us busy from the de- debut of his latest YouTube video, the Debbie Dirtbag. How are you doing, Ryan? Great, JJ. Thanks for having me. Um, glad you talked about the YouTube videos. It's a three-part series, the my personal rookie draft guide. So for those of you starting rookie draft soon, go ahead and check that out on YouTube. Now, you might have noticed a fresh face. Our special guest this evening, fresh off of a baseball diamond, I'd assume, somewhere. Uh, a writer for True North Fantasy, and we bet you can find him on Twitter, at Coach Craig Sport. It's Coach Craig. How you doing, buddy? Doing pretty good. And I, like you kind of mentioned, I do a lot of different things. So I write for those two. I help out with uh, Sons of Dynasty with some of the content they're putting out. We did a lot of rookie hype videos for their YouTube channel. I've been hoping, you know, do some optimization for SEO for getting those videos to pop and everything like that. I obviously have my own YouTube channel, Coach Craig Sports, where I got daily MLB DFS right now. I'm going through some NFL draft grades. When we get closer to NFL season, I do some fantasy content as well as DFS content. So a little bit of everything right now. Uh, did some talking about the rookies before the draft. We did uh, JC Money Design and myself. We did uh, day two and day three live stream besides round seven. So Nobody likes round seven. So you do <laughs> MLB DFS. That seems like such a grind. How do you find the time in your life to do that? Um, so a lot of it for me is just, uh, after I get done with this, I'll edit my draft grade video. And then after that, I'll do research uh, pitcher versus hitter stats. And then I'll kind of just go through those and compare it to like the guys that are kind of hitting pretty well right now and try to make the like, because you're making educated guesses more so than any other sport. It's kind of predictable, but it's not really like it's probably the least predictable sports in terms of DFS uh, outside of like USFL right now, which I'm doing a little bit of right now, too. I do a video of that every week, just kind of going through kind of be like hey i would play this guy in gpp i play this guy in cash i don't know how many people are actually playing cash for usfl but that's a whole nother story for a different day um but nba is definitely the most predictable i do that during the nba regular season then nfl obviously during the nfl regular season too so if it's dfs i probably do it i casually play golf i don't really cover that as much uh we do some nascar talk on sundays for a live show for super draft dfs as well which cricket cricket dfs yet Nah, <laughs> not cricket. Squash? <laughs> no. You wait, you wait. Yeah. It's next. Biggest. There's sport, always some. Biggest sport in the world. Uh, before we jump into the episode, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, mm-hmm. Gridiron Ratings has published our rookie draft guide, over 140 pages, rookie profiles for both offensive and IDP rookies, positional breakdowns, integrated draft boards for every type of league. Only fifteen dollars. I had the pleasure of editing the guide and it even impressed me and I'm cranky as all hell and nothing impresses me. So jump on gridiron ratings to get your copy gentlemen enough. No, no talk of news. Let's get right to the main. Oh, can I throw in one thing? Sure. Ronnie, if you're coming from Reddit, 
and you want the Aaron Donald jersey from those previous shows this weekend, you got to watch the mock draft because we're not announcing it until it's over. So stick around, <laughs> learn something about the rookies, and then we'll throw you the jersey if you want at the end. Thanks, Ron. Absolutely. We will be giving away the Aaron Donald jersey by the end of tonight's episode. Now, hope may spring eternal, but draft capital can crush dreams, gentlemen. We completed our pre-draft four-round rookie mock draft. And now that we know their landing spots, it's time to revisit to complete a post-draft two-round rookie. The rules are the same. 12-team, 1QB, PPR. We will be picking in the same order until the second round is complete. And the order for tonight is, as it shows up on the screen, Coach Craig is picking first, followed by Ryan, Don, and then Ronnie. So, Coach Craig, you are the guest tonight. You get to pick first. Where are you going? Well, typically, I don't really have the one-on-one anywhere. And if I did, I'd probably be trained out of it this year, honestly. So uh, but I'll still take Brees Hall first overall. I don't think there's too much debate with a lot of people. I mean, just depending on what some of the leagues that you're in, depending on who you're drafting with, I mean, some people might take a wide receiver first. Some people might take Kenneth Walker first just because he ended up in Seattle. And like consensus, like if you're just talking real, real big picture, not fantasy related. Kenneth Walker was the consensus RB1 pre-draft when you take across all like all the experts with from non-fantasy perspective. But then you also have to add in, uh, you know, the pass catch and all that stuff too. Yeah, uh, as a Jets fan, I am very happy with the pick of Brees Hall. We... We seem to have gotten some um, heat for it. Some of our mm -hmm. draft grades suffered because we went at the top of the second for a running back. Uh, you're not hearing me complain. Fantastic pick, Joe Douglas. Thank you. Next up on the board, Ryan. Well, it's pretty wild that the top two picks in this mock are going to be New York Jets because I'm going with Garrett Wilson here. He was my wide receiver one before the draft, and he is my wide receiver one after the draft. Uh, I, you know, I've seen a lot of people complaining about Wilson to the Jets because of Zach Wilson. Zach Wilson's going to be fine. I have a theory about what happened with him last year. They looked at the roster. They looked at Wilson. They said, hey, just go out there, get it all out of your system, make the mistakes, learn from it, come back stronger next year. And he's coming back this year with a true number one receiver in Garrett Wilson. And uh, I think he's going to I think he's going to be a perennial like 1,100, 1,200 plus yard receiver with upside for 1,400 even. Ooh, your mouth's got ears. Uh, Ronnie, what are you thinking about Garrett Wilson and Brees Hall? Two Jets going one, two. I think it's the most beautiful thing that I've ever seen be a reality in Dynasty football to have the New York football Jets potentially with a majority of the top two picks in dynasty football is just confirming my sus suspicions that we're in a simulation and whoever's in control is having fun. Uh, but I like Garrett <laughs> we Wilson. We are in end times, aren't we? Young man? <laughs> we, uh, but Garrett Wilson's a stud man. He was my favorite wide receiver pre-draft too. And uh, I think that this pick is going to go in a number of directions depending on your league. So if you've got it, either take the guy you like more than anyone else or trade back to where I'm picking at number four because that's my favorite spot in the drafts. <laughs> Well, before we get to number four, Don, you get to go number three. Ooh, Three's I don't interesting. Know what that means. Yeah. Three's interesting because two for me is an inflection point, whether you're taking both backs one and two, or you get into a high talent, really dynamic wide receiver. But I'm the beneficiary here, so I'm taking Kenneth Walker to third at three. And I'll tell you what, Seattle's backfield is primed to be taken over. I love what they did in the draft two brand new offensive tackles, an investment in an offensive line that they just don't do. Uh, for them to turn around and put that kind of capital there, that's awesome. And Walker's running ability is dynamic. He can catch the ball better than people are saying. If you look way back at his previous school, dude's got chops. That's going to blow up. It might not be year one, but by year two, he'll have chased out the rest and you're going to have a player on your hands. That's fantastic. I'm looking forward to them having a reliable running back who they can just hand the rock off to, like Pete Carroll <laughs> loves, loves to do. Coach Craig, 
do you see do you see Kenneth Walker getting the bulk of the carries this year? Yeah, I think he probably steps into most of it right away. I mean, you know, there's still a Rashad Penny truthers out there, but I think it's probably a split right away. And we we know Penny can't stay healthy at this point, so I'm not really concerned about that. He's on a one year deal either way, so the value should just go up in theory, but we'll, only time will tell. I think it was really interesting the offensive tackles they picked though, because you think of them being the run heavy team. And the biggest thing about Charles Cross and Abraham Lucas, they both came from air raid systems or mo- for most of their career, yeah. they were in air raid systems. So they're really good pass blockers. And the knock was kind of the running by or the run protection or running blocking. So that's kind of interesting, but I like both those tackles a lot. Cross was my offensive tackle number two. Lucas, I had a second round grade on, so I think they did very well with those two guys. Fantastic. Uh, Ronnie, you are up. Yeah, I uh, I wanted Kenneth Walker here. I uh, He's – I, we, we could talk on and on about him. We can cover him more in other shows, but people are out of their minds talking about him as, like, not being able to catch the ball. I would challenge you to find the last Michigan State running back that caught a lot of balls. Um, and he's the most talented back in this entire class, Brees Hall – included and uh, i think that kenneth walker is going to be in somebody that people regret not taking in the top three in a lot of drafts because it's probably going to happen in quite a few places that said i'm going to go with drake london it's an easy pick for me here and that's why i love the four spot because you're guaranteed to get kenneth walker drake london Traylon burks or garrett wilson and it's really a toss-up of who you like the most out of those three but i have a hunch that most people are going to have three of those guys ahead of their fourth guy. And if you're sitting in the fourth spot, you're just sitting pretty. And one of them's going to fall to you, and they're all equally good picks. Drake London is going to be a stud in the NFL. He is – I hate everything J.J. Zacharias said about him. All of this whole, like, possession receiver, all that. It's ridiculous. Go watch his tape. That is not who he is. And uh, he's going to tear up the NFL for a long, long time. It just might take a couple years before he pops on your teams because of the quarterback situation, especially if Desmond Ritter ends up getting the job here in the next 24 months. Now, Ryan, I used to bring up Drake London to you only to sour the Amon Ross St. Brown conversation. Mm -hmm. Uh, What do you think about Drake London, who was better at USC? than Amon Ra. I think Drake London's a very good receiver prospect. I don't think he's receiver one. I actually have him at six on my board. Uh, He's going off at super flex rankings, 109, so it'd be 108 in this case for me. I like him. I think he's going to be a productive player. I just don't think he's going to pop the way a lot of others are saying he will. He's... I'm worried about his speed. I, the corners are always going to be able to stick to him. He doesn't have that kind of wiggle to lose like smaller, more agile athletes. So he's, I think he's going to have to be overly physical to get a lot more catches than a guy like uh, Garrett Wilson, who gets open by, you know, creating that natural separation with like top tier route running and just being a better athlete than the guy across from him. Fair enough. Coach Craig. So I, I wanted to say too, Drake London, I know people question his athleticism, but the dude played college basketball as a freshman too. and was a two guard at USC. Grant, he didn't play a lot, but like, that's still something to note there too. And the dude wins off the release package. He wins at the top of the route. He wins in contested catches. And I know people criticize the contested catches too, but Keen Slovis was late throwing the ball a lot of the time too, when that was happening. So there's a lot of things there too, a lot of variables, but I think he's a very good player and he's going to end up producing pretty well. And him and Kyle Pitts will kind of help each other out a little bit. See if Calvin Ridley comes back next year or if he's somewhere else. But even when you talk about Ritter, I think Ritter's going to be in there at some point this year, just because he's a third round pick. They want to see what they have in him. If they, if they don't like what they have in him after one year, they're just going to pick somebody else. It's kind of like how Davis Mills was last year. Sure. Yeah. Uh, but for my pick, like this gets to the, be the point where I don't really want to make a pick here. This would be another trade down spot for me because I'd rather have one of those top four guys that already went. So I guess I'll take Traylon Burks here out of Tennessee. Obviously, there is the upside with pretty open wide receiver room outside of Robert Woods there, who's coming off an ACL injury himself. Uh, Traylon Burks obviously not, did very well in the SEC. 
mainly poor quarterback play besides the one year Felipe Franks, which some people like to knock on him, but he was very good at Arkansas for that one year. Um, there is a little bit of concern there. Obviously, the measurables were not as nice as we like to see, but there was some kind of work ethic concerns with him coming up to the draft. Like he didn't start working out till like the last minute and that's why he didn't run as well. But then he had his pro day like 10 days to two weeks later and didn't even like try to test better at anything else really. So you're looking at a guy that's kind of had some weight concerns, weight fluctuation, at least in college. So with the top tier athlete, hopefully you keep that in perspective. They have a dietitian on the team and they're hopefully going to keep that. But if things don't pan out, you could be looking at another Calvin Benjamin and gets up 250 pounds and then maybe it's one good year. So that, there's kind of the concerns there, but I think what he probably ends up being is kind of what people wanted LaVisca Chanel to be. He's not going to be Debo Samuel. He's not going to be AJ Brown, but I think that's a more fair comparison. And he's more similar to LaVisca Chanel coming out of college. Don, where are you at with Traylon Burks? Do you think the Titans did the right thing by getting rid of A.J. Brown and taking Traylon? Well, considering the contract demands, the Titans had no chance. There was They were just up against it. There was no way to fit the contract that A.J. Brown wanted underneath their cap, especially this late in the ball game after just handing out contracts to pass rushers and working mm-hmm. on the offensive line that just wasn't possible. So to have to pivot as quickly as they had to and make a deal come together quickly to get the 18th pick. Plus they did pretty well for themselves as for the player. I like the size. I like the ability, even if they have to work him out of the slot, there's still potential there. And with no real consistent tight end threat in Tennessee, he can work out of the slot. He can work closer to line of scrimmage and you can do a lot. They ran bubble screen after bubble screen two years ago. They can do it again. There's ways to get a guy the ball especially with his size and his catch radius, as long as they keep him under control, basically by sitting on his dietitians and so forth, that's doable at the pro mm-hmm. level. And I, I think he can be productive. The chances for the just massive target share is absolutely there. Ryan, where are you going at with pick one six? Jameson Williams. This is an easy one. I have him number three on my board. And so uh, getting him at six here, that's value. Jameson Williams has the highest upside of any receiver in this class, and he landed on a team with a vacuum at the wide receiver one position. And, you know, Jameson Williams has like 1,500 yard type upside. He is just uber freaking talented. And if it wasn't for the ACL, I think that consensus would be a whole hell of a lot higher on him. Uh, he, he just has that he has the kind of speed that nobody can hang with. He can he's a good route runner. He has really good hands. I just don't see him not coming back as good as ever after this injury. The ACL is really just it happens, but these guys they don't have typically careers ruined over it as much anymore at least. Mm-hmm. So he's going to come back just fine, I believe, and he's going to be a hell of a receiver. Jared Goff can support quality fantasy options he showed it throughout his career and with the rams and i don't think that golf is really even going to be the quarterback for the future there i i wouldn't put it past um holmes to uh the gm there in detroit to try to pull off a similar move to what the rams did is build up a killer roster and then trade for a veteran quarterback who can put them over the hump All right. Well, gentlemen, sitting at 1-6, halfway through the first round, uh, question for you. What is the highest pick? This comes from Dave Heilman. Uh, What's up, Dave? Um, What's the highest pick that you would trade for Hollywood Brown or Rondale Moore following uh, Hopkins' suspension? I can I can jump in and just say the Hopkins suspension doesn't change it for me either way. I will, already was moving on from Hopkins in Dynasty. I think he's going to be fine this year when he plays, but those two guys are going to be the guys of the future there. Um, I don't know what I would – I'll let somebody answer the, the trade thing, but the Hopkins thing didn't move the needle me for me for their value outside of redraft. What about you, Craig? Uh, so I think it's probably like 110, 111 range. That's where it falls off for me. I think I'd rather have Hollywood Brown than some of those guys. In theory, they could get out from DeAndre Hopkins after this season. They'll save $8 million. It'd probably be the year after that. 
but you know, Hollywood Brown and Kyler Murray probably going to be together for the long run. I would assume obviously Kyler gets paid this year. Marquise Hollywood Brown probably gets paid that year after that, or if he doesn't get paid, then you piss Kyler Murray off and then we got a whole another situation on our hands too. So uh, it could be very interesting there. And then like in terms of Rondell Moore, that's a tough one just because like, I don't know how much Hopkins suspension impacts him. Like he should be on the field more, but they also drafted Trey McBride and they gave Zach Ertz an extension. So they might want to put two tight ends on the field a little bit more yeah. often. Plus Cliff Kingsbury's boy is Antoine Wesley. Like he had him in college. He loves that dude. And when Cliff Kingsbury loves somebody, he's going to do whatever he can for that guy. Obviously we've seen that with Kyler Murray going number one overall. So. All right, Don, are you on board? Uh, yeah, I would even tell you that the last that this is the last pick I would keep. So one eight and beyond is what I would consider for Hollywood Brown. But one seven, I'm keeping it and I'm keeping it for Chris, Chris Olave landing in New Orleans. Dude is an absolute technician. He can run any route you want. And he's probably the prototypical prototypical wide receiver, too. He'll fit into that offense just beautifully. He can do whatever you want. You can put him on an island. You can run him away from the bunch. You can put him just in 11 personnel as the other wide receiver. He can do it all fast, big enough to catch with a good catch radius. Love the hands. Love the talent. Whew. That was enthusiastic. Uh, a great segue. I give that a 10. 10 out, that's a 10 out of 10. Woo. Great job, Don. You pass. <laughs> you get an A. Ronnie, where are you going with 1-8? I'm going to take the guy that I couldn't get in the Writers League that I ended up just sitting on Chris Olave after an auto draft. I thought about it and was like, I'll get Sky Moore in other leagues. I'll just use Chris Olave in this one. But I love Sky Moore's potential. I think his potential in the long term paired up with Pat, Patrick Mahomes. Whew, he, he, he might, with Jamison Williams, he might have like tied for the highest long-term fantasy potential if things work out. I'm not counting on it to work out that way, but... Psh, Scott Moore's an animal. He was one of my favorite players pre-draft. I know that you guys talked about him a lot on other pods. Jeff DiMatteo and I talked about him a bit on the Chop Shop. He's been a hot topic of discussion throughout the offseason in the whole Gridiron Ratings team, and I don't think he could have gone to a better spot. I mean, I, I love him. I'm happy to take him here. Yeah, you want to go to a coach that's offensively inclined and possibly the best throwing quarterback in the league. <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty good landing spot. Yep. I would say. Uh, yeah. Plus he had the biggest hands of any wide receiver at the combine and he's only five foot 10. So that's, yeah, it was uh 10 and one eighth inch hands. I think he had, and then, you know, everybody pre combine, they're talking about how big like Trey Lon Burke's hands were like, you wore three X gloves. And then his ended up being like sub 10. I'm like, what? <laughs> Yeah, I think Traylon Burks might have fat fingers. Let me, let me throw one other thing in on Sky Moore because uh, I've heard a lot of people and read a lot actually on Reddit with people talking about McCall Hardman and this and this kind of a crowded room, this year, this and that. I, I am not worried at all about McCall Hardman. With Sky, Sky Moore, okay. McCall Hardman should be applying for jobs with other teams in the next two years. I mean, this Sky Moore has the vertical ability that McCall Hardman has. He might be a touch slower, but it doesn't matter. He's a better route runner. He's got better hands, and he is better with the ball in his hands than McCall Hardman, and I have no problem saying all four of those things. McCall Hardman is the guy that hurt, is hurt the worst by the Sky Moore pick on that team. Hmm. Yeah. And I'll just say he was actually recruited as a cornerback at Western Michigan, then converted to wide receiver full-time too, so he's only going to get better. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine being that young and talented? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope, me neither. Uh, speaking of young and talented, Coach Craig, you're up yeah. next at 1-9. Well, I ain't that young no more, so I'm over oh, the hill. Fantasy easy, elite. easy young man. Uh, so this pick's easy for me. This is Christian Watson out of North Dakota State. I have been a fan of Christian Watson since 2020, pretty much before anybody knew who he was. So when Trey Lance was first kind of getting his little hype, no interceptions and all that stuff, I started watching the film. I'm like, hey, who's this number one guy? Like, he is just murdering like all these corners. Like, it's not even close. And yes, everybody's like, oh, the raw stats aren't that good, but still had a 40% dominator rating this year. He accounted for 35.3% of his team's receiving yards this year. His team ran the ball 62% of the time, and they were in blowouts because they 
are essentially the Alabama, the FCS. They just beat the crap out of teams. So they don't need to throw that often. Plus, obviously, they got a little bit of a downtick in quarterback this year since Trey Lance was gone. But even when Trey Lance was there, he was only throwing the ball like 14 to 18 times a game anyway. So like people are like, oh, you only got like four catches a game. But like, do you realize how much that is when the quarterback's only thrown it 14 times a game? And he was involved, you know, as a punt returner and arounds and everything else like that. And like this guy could be the complete unicorn of this class. We don't see guys that are six foot four, you know, his size, his weight run four, three sixes. Like it just doesn't happen. Yes. There are some drop concerns there, but when you're, but that kind of goes back to how many times they threw to. So if he, if the whole year he dropped six passes, the drop percentage is going to look worse because he only had so many targets compared to some of these other guys. I don't think it's a major issue long term, but maybe it's not quite right away this year. But long term, like this could be the unicorn at wide receiver in this class. And at this point in the draft, that's what I'm trying to shoot for. I take Sky Moore and I take Christian Watson over Chris Olave myself personally, just because I know what Chris Olave is. And that doesn't excite me as much for fantasy. He's just kind of like that second wide receiver. His upside is kind of like an Emmanuel Sanders type. Fair enough. That's a great career, not necessarily great for fantasy. Uh, and I will say, I will say that too with Chris Olave. Just sorry to cut you off real quick. The nope. Saints better hope he's awesome because the amount of draft picks they traded up to essentially have that number eleven pick is ridiculous. That's like a Bill O'Brien type of trade, which I know too well for my Texans fandom. Yeah, I thought I somebody posted an overall yeah. breakdown of what the Saints gave up yeah. for their Austin couple. Gale from PFF did. I know that off the top of my head. Yeah, and I forget what it was. It, but it was shocking. It was like, eesh. they better show up. They better show up. Uh, Ryan, you're up next. One ten. I'm gonna go I'm with James, James here. Look here. And, and my reason for that, for that is... Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Ryan. You sound like a robot. All right. So Ryan is going to log off and log back on, which uh, is the normal IT go-to whenever anything breaks down, right? Like 99% sure he said James Cook. Look who's here. What's up, Ryan? All right, I am back in business. Do I sound non-robotic? Perfect. Great. (laughs) So I'm going James Cook here. Uh, He's uh, he got second round draft capital. He landed in the perfect landing spot, Buffalo Bills. You know, I've seen a lot of chatter about concerns over the kind of workload he can handle. I have him around 210, like as a just a safe projection that's 12.4 touches per game i think that's reasonable even for a guy who's relatively undersized i think that's reasonable for a running back taken with six i'm sorry second round draft capital uh and like 60 catch a season type upside if not more so i i'm buying into that because you could easily with his skill set become like a low end RB one when he's throwing all that receiving work that he's going to get. I, I know Josh Allen's probably still going to vulture the touchdowns on the goal line, but he'll have some explosive breakaways. He's a fast guy. He has those cook genetics. I'm, I'm taking James cook in the late first round everywhere I can. I don't know how I feel about James cook. Don, where are you? I'm with you in that I worry that he's not going to get the high value touches around the goal line to go with it. However, if there's a back that's going to succeed in Buffalo, it's James Cook style running back. That's very adept to catching the football and can be an outstanding outlet and something that the right Allen is going to throw to and not necessarily call him his own number to. So I think if there was going to be a running back to succeed in Buffalo, I think Cook is a great way to go. Now, sticking with you, Don, who are you going with at pick 11? Oh, it's time to get my black and gold colored spectacles out. Here we go. I'm going to go to the second round of the real draft, and I want George Pickens here. George Pickens is an absolute monster. He's 21 years old. There's still meat on the developmental bone here, and that's something that the Steelers absolutely love to do is get guys that are younger or on the younger end. At 6'3", 200, and coming off ACL surgery, the dude already ran 4'4", 7". That's only going to improve as he distances himself from the surgery. He's got excellent body control, can already stretch the field as evidenced by the national title game. And 
with the Steelers wide receivers as they are. And Claypool, ironically, calling the number, he may very well have been calling the number of his replacement because he has been underwhelming and Pickens does everything that Claypool does better. That was my question for you, Don. Um, A little bit concerned, right? I mean, Claypool and Pickens, are they the same? I I think of that meme with Spider-Man. Right. Yeah, it... What they are is different animals in that Pickens can run better routes and run more of the route tree than Claypool can. Claypool is definitely your prototypical outside go guy. Pickens has more talent, more athleticism, and more of a dynamic explosive route runner that has the possibility to do more for you on in-cuts, crossers, and less of the just jump ball dependency that such a big guy in Claypool really has. So I like Pickens. I like the developmental possibility here. Call me a homer. I don't care. He's my guy. Craig, are you calling him a homer? Uh, no, I just kind of disagree. I think Pickens is more the jump ball guy. 80 is something like 80% of his production came on nine routes and slant routes at Georgia, like in his career. Like, So I think he still has a lot of work to do in developing his route tree as well. I don't say that Claypool has still Claypool still obviously does too, but I think Claypool is obviously the bigger, faster guy at this point in time. I think Pickens is a little bit of a lesser version of that, but they're similar players to me. And the weird part to me was like, no offense to like Kenny Pickett, but he's got like an NFL average arm and they're building like all these kind of guys that are, you know, they're more deep play options with a chase Claypool with the George Pickens and Calvin Austin, who I really do like a lot. So it's an interesting, it's going to see, be very interesting to see how the offense all comes together. And then obviously you got the big question if they give Devante or excuse me, Deontay Johnson a contract or not too. So that's going to be a big question mark coming up pretty soon. The biggest, uh, that's a huge question mark for Pittsburgh. Ronnie, finish off the first round for me. Uh, well, I already got two wide receivers here, so I'm going to skip over the guy I would take with just Sean Dotson. I'm also going to assume that this imaginary team is competing for championships because that's how it is in every single league I'm in, except for one of the ones I just joined. Um, I'm going with, uh, why am I losing his name? Damian Pierce. I, I don't know why I, I forgot who I was taking there for a second. I think Damian Pierce could very well lead all rookies in touches as a running back. I thought there was going to be more after that. I um, thought there was too, but then I felt good about it. <laughs> good. Now, no, listen. <laughs> if you're feeling good, walk off. Craig, as a Houston fan, correct? Yes. I, what are we as thinking? a Houston fan, I hope he's right. <laughs> uh, there are some concerns. Like, I think he's very talented, but then you also have like the committee concerns at Florida. He's always been kind of stuck in this committee. He's very efficient per touch, but how is that going to uh, translate to the NFL level? Obviously, more teams are going to committees, and I think he's a very good player, but he's also a guy that you're talking about with the draft capital that he got. I wouldn't be surprised if he gets replaced in 2023 with the ranked back class that is coming out in that year, or at least supplemented, kind of like we've seen like with Michael Carter. Sell so yes. high on Damian. He'll blow up as a rookie and then sell him. Yeah, That'd I mean, plan. at least his competition is just Marlon Mack and Rex Burkett. So if you can't yeah. beat out those guys, you probably don't have a bright future anyways. Yep. No, not at all. Don, looking at this first round, which name pre-draft would you have scoffed at? Pre-draft scoffed at. Looking at it now, uh, I wouldn't have talked about Pierce in round one at all. It's just not possible. But with the other guys landing in difficult spots and him getting a spot that he can absolutely dominate a backfield, he definitely got elevated for sure. Uh, For me, probably a whole round. I had him at the top of three to sneak into the back of one. That's really something. All right. Well, let's start the second round. Coach Craig, you are up first again. Yeah, so I was just going to put two. I threw in the chat, too, that um, or in the private chat what the New Orleans Saints gave up. So this was from PFF Austin Gale. So the New Orleans Saints essentially traded picks 98, 101, 120, a first rounder in 2023, and a 2024 second rounder for Chris Olave. 
Well, That's he better lot. be good. Yeah. He better so, be good. He's going to be good. That. Two, so essentially two thirds, a fourth, a first round pick and a second round pick. AJ Brown went for less. Yeah, no. <laughs> so Chris Olave is like amazing or something. I don't know. Cost a lot more money. Well, yeah, AJ Brown went for a one to three and uh hundred twenty five and... mil a year. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technically. It's a little um, bill at the end. Yeah. But it's probably pretty similar to the Tyree Kill trade. So that plus paying him like thirty million dollars a year too. So we'll see. We'll see. It's all they, uh, they have it. They have yeah. it. Uh, but in this pick, this would be another spot where I'd be looking to trade out because like everything that I really want in this draft is pretty much gone. I'm actually in a draft right now where I'm trying to trade the two, two pick. I'm actually trying to either trade it away or trade it plus something else for Christian Watson. So then I'd have Christian Watson and Sky more in that draft, but that's a whole other story for a different day. Uh, so when I'm looking here, you got Jahan Dotson who got the real life draft capital in the first round. I think somebody would still value trading for him. Like if he has a blow up week, there is always the possibility that Terry McLaurin just like walks away and they don't resign him. That would be your, like what you're betting on. If you're picking Jahan Dotson, I do like the talent. I really hate this landing spot, especially with Carson Wentz there. Uh, Cause he's probably like third, fourth option in the pecking order there. It's just not pretty for me. Uh, so I'm probably just going to go down to running back. I'm going to bet on a guy that I think could potentially work his way in a role this year and keep his job long-term. And that's my boy, Tyler Algier out of BYU. Uh, uh, so he is another converted linebacker. When somebody asked me to explain him, I'm like, he's kind of like Javante William light. So he's not obviously as good. He didn't have as high a draft capital, but obviously has no for nose for the end zone, had a very high broken tackle percentage had like the most yards per contact in all of college football last year. The dude's very, very good in pass protection. He's a very, very underrated, underrated wide or receiving back out of the backfield too. You didn't see as much of it when Zach Wilson was there because Zach Wilson would just take off and run instead because he is a very underrated athlete as well. So there wasn't quite as much of that, but like I was just watching the Zach Wilson film like initially and I'm like, wait, wait, who the heck's this running back? Because like you could tell that he was good go look at the stats and I'm like, Oh, this guy over we're like a thousand yards. And then like they lost Zach Wilson, obviously this year they lost three or four. They're starting offensive linemen from the previous year. I'm like, okay, let's see what this guy does without the offensive line, without the first round quarterback comes out and dominates and has 20 plus touchdowns. I'm like, okay. So this is somebody we need to talk about. Obviously he didn't run as good at the combine as people thought, but four, six for a guy that's 224 pounds. I was at the combine. The dude's shoulders are freaking huge. <laughs> like, they're about the size of your head like it's just crazy but uh, i think he's one of the guys that we're talking about in this range of running backs that could potentially keep his job long term obviously probably going to split carries with cordero uh patterson this year maybe damian williams but he's 30 years old like and he wasn't very good last year first of all and they already cut mike davis so i think there's a very wide open door there some people might talk about the wide open door for zamir white but i got some other concerns there and i think He's a guy you have to draft somebody to supplement him. Love this pick. I I love Ty, Tyler. Uh, I was hoping that the Jets would get him a little bit later. Then they went and took Brees Hall, so I was satisfied. Um, yeah. But he was yeah, a player oh, I shucks. definitely liked. Definitely. Rats. Like, Ryan, <laughs> where are you going with the one-two? John Dotson. Because he's number two in the pecking order on that team. He's going to be their second best receiving option. Um, and Carson Wentz is, he's a shell of himself, but, and he might be replaced in the near future, but he's capable of supporting two fantasy relevant options. And Jahan Dotson's really not that dissimilar from Terry McLaurin, who they found a way to deploy him to his full potential. So I'm not worried about Dotson, his landing spot. He's going to be productive. He, and if McLaurin does walk, he does step into their sort of number one role with hopefully a better quarterback at that time. Now, Ronnie, I know you were a little bit excited about Jahan Dotson. What do you think about that landing spot? I think that there is a, I would be surprised if Terry McLaurin is playing football for the commanders in 2024. Um, and I think that Jahan Dotson is pure talent wise. He's right in that tier two of this class. You've got three or four guys 
wide receiver that are in tier one. And you got another four or five that are in tier two, and he's right there in that mix. He could be really, really good for fantasy. I don't know that I really agree that Carson Wentz can support two viable fantasy assets at this point in his career, but I think that it could happen. It's not out of the realm of possibility. And uh, I'm I'm making trades for this guy this season. I If I can't get him in drafts, I'm waiting. I'm waiting until he hits a three-game stretch where he doesn't do a dang thing because that offense isn't doing a dang thing. And I'm scooping him up for whatever picks I can shell. I love him. I think he's going to be great long-term. He's got a lot of staying power. Love the enthusiasm. Double D, where are you going? So if we were talking super flex here, it'd be Kenny Pickett time, but we're not, so it isn't. And realistically, he, the Steelers just do not run an offense capable of supporting a one quarterback guy that's going to put up the yards, the touchdowns, and the volume. So at this point, give me a guy who's going to be a wide receiver two on his team this year. I'll take Alec Pierce out of Indy because realistically, I think the target share is going to be there. He's got a veteran quarterback who knows what they're doing. They did a lot of work to try and solve the offensive tackle problems, even in the draft. I know, I know it's an older rookie, but still. It's better than everything they've had. They have a dominant running game. Alec Pierce is a talent. He's big. He runs. He can do slants. He can go down the field. And with a quarterback that has talent and is not completely cooked yet, I'll take Pierce at this point. Coach Craig, you're giggling. You don't you don't like the Alec Pierce choice uh, there? I don't think so. I don't think this is the best landing spot for him because Matt Ryan has really regressed on the deep ball the last few years. You could argue part of that's based on the Falcons offensive line getting behind a better offensive line might help him out. But obviously he's been a guy that likes to work the middle of the field a little bit better. So that's not really what you're doing with Pierce unless you're running him on slant routes or anything like that because you're really running him on go balls and slant routes. Maybe you get like a slow go off of there and stuff like that. Uh, the one thing I was really surprised about is like how shocked people were that he ran fast. Like, I guess yeah. you don't like as much on tape, but like the dude was like an all straight, he was like all state and track in high school. So it's not like he was ever slow. Yeah, absolutely. Ronnie, you are up next one, four. Well, Alex Pierce is who I would have taken. Um, and I will a note on Alec Pierce and the other guy I wanted to take at this pick, uh, in the writers league, I traded up at the two Oh six to get Tyler Algier. And, um, that's a super flex league. So you had a couple wide receivers. That's also tight end premium. So you had a couple tight ends. Um, and in this draft, like if I hadn't, if I hadn't already gotten Sky Moore and Drake London, I might not have gone with Damian Pierce there. I might have gone for Jahan Dotson. Um, but this is tough. Like at this point, there's a bunch of dudes that I kind of view the same. I know Rashad White's sitting there and people are going to get excited about that. I don't care about the Bucks. Tom Brady's not going to play next year, most likely. And I don't really know what they're going to be looking at. And he's going to get replaced by somebody eventually. He's not, he's not a stud. Um, but uh, I'll go with John Mechie. I'm just going to – actually, let me take that back. I'm going to go with Trey McBride. <laughs> At this I don't point know if you draft, could do that. I didn't, take right. my hand, I didn't take my hand off the chessboard. I haven't moved the, pish, the piece officially. The card um, didn't make it to the table. <laughs> All right. I, I'll allow it. Um, and here's my rationale. At this point, you're looking at Tier 3 of wide receivers. Yep. You're looking at Tier 2 of running backs in a weak class. Might as well take the top guy at the tier of tight ends, even though it's not a tight end premium league, right? Um, if you're going to stash one of these tight ends, I'd say him and Jelani Woods have, are the two guys that four years from now might be like reliable tight end ones. And uh, I'll take McBride. We were talking about DeAndre Hopkins earlier. I know Zach Ertz is still there. Somebody mentioned that this might force them to play McBride a little bit more than they had planned. I absolutely agree. I think that of all the players on that team, besides Hollywood getting traded there, of course, that it's Trey McBride is the guy I think benefits the most as a rookie tight end from DeAndre Hopkins mission six games. He's going to see some snaps that he probably wouldn't have otherwise. I'm always excited when the first tight end goes off the board. Coach Craig, you are up next. Yeah. And it's an important to note too, with Trey McBride, he had 90 catches on a run first team in Colorado State. Granted, he was the only real option they had in the receiving game, and their quarterback sucked, but that's a whole other story for a different day. And funny enough, I actually have Pierce and McBride back-to-back in my rankings, too. 
they're a little bit lower, but uh, my rankings that I do have right now are for super flex too. So there's a couple of quarterbacks squeezed in their head. Uh, let's see where we're at real quick. Uh, so I'm going to go probably with a personal favorite of mine, David Bell, wide receiver for Cleveland. Very productive career for Purdue. Everybody freaked out over the combine. And he ran slow. We all knew he was going to run slow. And literally goes into the guy that he probably compares the best to his role in Cleveland in Jarvis Landry. If they can work him out of the slot, it's going to be really interesting actually to see who they use in the slot there when they do have a slot, whether it's him, whether it's like Amari Cooper. Maybe they throw somebody else there, but like I don't think you're not gonna put down with Peoples Jones there. They tried throwing Anthony Schwartz there last year and it just didn't work. Like I don't know what you do with that guy at this point. He's just a track star, so that's a whole nother story for a different day. <laughs> Maybe let him return a couple kicks, but yeah, there's not much use for him. He, he kind of showed that last year. They tried. They really did. did try to get Schwartz the ball, but well, he didn't even run the route. Half the time he ran the wrong route. Like, he didn't know what he was doing. Yeah, that tends to hurt you in the NFL. Cleveland know. does not run a complex offense either. <laughs> All right, Ryan, you are up next, my friend. Where are you going with the 1-6? Six? Uh, 2-6, six, sorry. All right. Uh, uh, let's go. I'm between Kenny Pickett and Rashad White. Let's go Rashad White. I actually liked the landing spot in the draft capital third round to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Leonard Fournette needs a running mate. If we're worried about Keyshawn Vaughn and uh, who was it? Gio Bernard at this point, uh, what are we even doing playing dynasty? Rashad White's going to see a lot of playing time as a rookie, and he's going to get a lot of the receiving work. He's a quality runner of the football to boot. So I, I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that as a rookie, he could average somewhere like 10 touches a game, maybe not to begin the year, but as the, as the season wears on. So I think he's going to be a quality flex piece by the end of the season. And he has RB two type upside going into the future. That's awesome to hear. Um, and he's still available actually in our, uh, mock draft that we're doing right now i was thinking of picking him up soon i don't they want to can tell actually you guys. they can actually move on for money for net and save a 1.5 million dollars next year too if they really want to Ooh. i think they're building a lot of their deals based <laughs> upon like as soon as brady's done jettison it all and start over right away but mm. we'll see if when that happens oh we have a comment from gary van dyke Gary has the fourth overall rookie pick. Who am I looking at if you're lucky? Uh, Drake London, according to us. Drake London, Kenneth Walker, Traylon Burks. I think you are kind of in the cat seat position, Gary. So good for you. Good for you. Don. Oh, that leads us to Don. Don, where are you going with one seven? Back around again. Well, looking at stuff now, you're you guys are absolutely right. We're in the ifs, whens, and coulds. Uh, as far as if, whens, and coulds go, I'll take Isaiah Spiller here because I want somebody who's going to clean out all that trash in the Charger backfield. And now we finally have the sidecar. We finally have the guy who can compliment Eckler and take some of the goal line touches, some of the hard work, some of the short yardage, and yet still catch the ball. Is still a good, decisive runner, patient, good cuts, might not be the fastest guy in the world, but he's got good size, good strength, runs with power. I'll take Spiller. Fantastic. Eckler has needed that running mate. They've tried the past few drafts to find somebody. And I mean, what? Josh Kelly. Who was did, who did they pick up last year? Larry Roundtree. Larry Roundtree. Yeah. Leaving left off that D. Yeah. Uh oh. Hopefully, somebody. I mean, Eckler's going to miss some games. He misses a couple games every year. Uh, I'm not saying he's injury prone because we don't use that phrase, but they're running backs in the NFL. So he could definitely see some playing time early. Craig, are you on board with Isaiah Spiller? Oh, uh, yeah. Isaiah Spiller is my running back too pre draft. Obviously, the measurables did not help him. I think he's a very good underrated runner of the football. He's very smart, instinctive player. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. And I will say too, for Austin Eckler, I'd be worried for some of these touchdowns, not just because they brought Spiller in, but because they also drafted Xander Horvath with the seventh round pick. who's like Mike Allstott jr. Who I, who honestly, when 
you know, when you compare him and Mike Allstott, they're very similar players. He actually modeled his game after Mike Allstott, and they both went to Purdue. And that dude's, they have him listed as a fullback, but he'll probably get some goal line touches. So you could see some of those disappear. Maybe this is the time to get off of Austin Eckler. He's kind of at the age where we start seeing fantasy production fall off for most running backs. Uh, I don't think, I don't think there's really that negative connotation around him right now like they people are really worried about spiller and kind of if horvath gets some goal line touches or something like that most people in the community aren't worried yet so i think it's still a decent to sell on him yeah it's a good thought how eckler's what 27 uh, i think he's 26 going on 27 but uh, he's an old older yeah all right ronnie some, oh i'm sorry greg go ahead Oh, somebody had a really good tweet. I can't remember when it was, but it's like running backs like going into their age 27 season or something like that. Like none of them have finished in the top five in like the last five or six years or something like that. Uh, Derrick Henry would have last year if he didn't get hurt, obviously. But I think that I think that tweet's not relevant to Eckler because the touch mm-hmm. threshold is more important than the age typically. Mm-hmm. And Eckler is Eckler is a unique guy who's not he's he's twenty he's twenty six going on twenty seven who has yeah, the yeah. touches of a twenty four year old. Um, I give me John Mechie. Nah, got him anyway. Yeah, <laughs> whatever. I there's a lot of people that are down on this guy. Um, a lot of people think that he's just like a glorified slot receiver. Yada yada. I'm an SEC guy. I've watched way too many Alabama football games. Um, hate them so much. Go ball. <laughs> but uh Mechie's talented, man, and he's got wheels and he still has room to grow. And he's going to a team that's got Brandon Cooks, Nico Collins, I'm forgetting one other guy. But <sighs> Mechie's probably seeing the field year one as a rookie. And uh I don't know that Brandon Cooks is gonna be in this league forever at this point. I'm surprised he's still playing. I think his brains probably look like scrambled eggs. And uh, John Mechie, I think, is going to have a place in this league. It feels gross to have two Houston Texans in this draft. But you know what? I got too many shares of Jalen Tolbert everywhere else in this hypothetical universe we're living in for this draft. So give me John Mechie. Listen, two Texans. We had two Jets go. I know. We're in a simulation. Cats loving dogs. Uh... (laughs) All right, Coach Craig. Yeah, I'm kind of more in the camp that Mechie is just going to be like a good slot wide receiver in time. I think he kind of ends up being like a, a Jamison Crowder where he gives you like wide receiver three production. Maybe you can trade him for more at some point in time. And I think that's ideally what you're hoping for is just be able to flip him for something a little bit more. He could turn into a big target share for this Houston Texans team, especially if they do end up moving on from Brandon Cooks. Nico Collins didn't show enough last year when he really needed to. And I wouldn't be surprised if they had somebody else again next year. Uh, but for my pick, this is where we get to the nitty gritty, especially in one quarterback. Like if this is super flex, I'd probably be taking a quarterback here at the end of the second round. I assume Kenny Pickett's gone at that point already. So at that point, like I usually take like a Desmond, I, I take Desmond Ritter more than Malik Willis just because I don't want to wait around for two years to see if Malik Willis is even good because Ritter, you know, is at least going to play this year and I can, or like you flip that pick for a second round pick or once Ritter starts, you trade him for a second round pick in 2023 for a guy that just really wants a quarterback or believes in Desmond Ritter. Um, Going down here, I am going to do it a little bit different this time. I'll do Jelani Woods tight end for the Colts. Obviously we know Matt Ryan loves the guys that can attack the middle of the field and his tight ends in general. So he is like the better version of Mo Ali Cox, who a lot of people out there really do love. And oddly enough, they drafted him and then they drafted some random other six foot seven tight end later on, like at a Youngstown state that really didn't do anything in college, but he's like, transferred from some smaller school to Youngstown state and stuff too. And it's kind of raw, but apparently they just love really big tight ends, except for Kylan Granson, who used is pretty much just like a slot tight end. He actually played wide receiver at Rice before transferring to SMU. If people don't know that. All right. Number 10, Ryan. All right. I know I talked about Kenny Pickett in the la- uh, on the last selection, but I'm that I don't want to talk about the quarterback here. I want to take Zamir white. Uh, Cause I want to, I'd actually rather talk about his prospects he landed with the Raiders and the Raiders also didn't pick up Josh Jacobs fifth year option. So Zamir white goes in there as the backup to Jacobs. Jacobs has never really been 
the uh, he's always had a running mate, another relevant running back who's taking touches away. That's going to be Zamir White this year. Jacobs has also been consistently getting worse since his rookie season. And last year he was a 3.9 yards per carry guy. Uh, and then in 21, he was a 4.0 yards per carry guy. And it's not absurd to suggest that Zamir White could go in there and hit like a 4.3, 4.4 better per carry and incentivize the team to give him the ball more often because he's making stuff happen more often when he is given the ball over Jacobs. So if he flashes this year, you just walked into a potential lead back for the 2023 season. At the end of the second round, which is immediate an amazing value. Yeah, that first uh, draft of the Raiders crew, right? Their three first round picks, none of whom had their fifth round option picked up. It's a gr- bunch of Gruden grinders over there. You know what I mean? Yeah, well, they're definitely going to be making some grinders at the local deli uh, after they get cut shortly. Um, Don, no, come on. That was a good grinder joke. No, is that just uh, I'm a- sitting over here, navy beans, navy beans, hoagies and grinders. Thank you. Anyway, well, guess we'll just get out the black and gold again. Oh no, <laughs> I'll do you, it. Do ahead, go ahead. At this point, the one guy who's definitely going to be a starting quarterback because he's going to beat out Turbo. Turbo's only on a two-year deal, after which they can easily get out after this year. Realistically, he's an accurate quarterback, good enough mobility to get you something. They're going to try to put in more of a a mobile offense where they're rolling their quarterbacks, doing more of that kind of stuff. He can get you a first down, tough kid, going to protect the football. And this is something we usually don't get out of a college prospect. We get a guy who we know can already play in that environment, can already play on that specific field in whatever weather is thrown out at him because that's where he played his college ball, literally had to walk across the hallway to go from the pit a facility to the Pittsburgh Steelers facility. If there's a team that has more familiarity with their prospect, I don't know about it. So I'll go with that. Yeah. Did anybody see the meme of the giant uh, AirPod? Yeah. (laughs) With with little Kenny Pickett hands on it. (laughs) Fan smells like cabbage. Carney. So um, if you watch the uh, draft coverage show when we had our Kenny Pickett card up, instead of a player image, it was the picture of the Burger King guy. Oh, no. <laughs> so there actually is something about why his hand size was smaller too. That he had like he's got something with his thumb that it can't extend all the way the out. Double jointedness. Yeah. Yep. Sure. We'll let Kyle and the guys tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ronnie. Use better words than thumb weird. Weird thumb. <laughs> Our final pick of our mock draft. You know, as a guy with small looking, hands myself, um, fine with not Kenny shocked. Pickett going there. <laughs> you definitely have small hands. These energy. little babies right here. Um, there's three guys I'd be fine with here. Uh, I joked earlier, Jalen Tolbert was a guy I was looking at at the last pick. I think he's going to be fine in the NFL. He's just got two guys I like better ahead of him that aren't going to go away anytime soon. So I'm going to skip over Jalen Tolbert. I'm going to skip over Wandale, even though he has the best trap capital of this group right now. Um, I'm going to jump all the way down in these pre-draft or rankings from GR and go for Khalil Shakir in Buffalo. Hmm. He's really talented. He's a great guy. I actually just dropped Isaiah McKenzie in uh, our writer's league. Um, I, I think Khalil Shakir is probably not going to do a whole lot in his rookie season, but I don't believe in this whole Gabriel Davis hype train thing. I think that that guy might have a couple years of relevance in the NFL. Maybe Stefan Diggs isn't getting younger. I know they just gave him money. Um, and this is a team that I would think would like to use more than just one guy on offense on a regular basis at the receiver position. And it sounds like they're making the moves to do that. Khalil Shakir is one of the more exciting, like dart throw prospects in this class. And I, I got the dude that's paired up with Patrick Mahomes. I'll go take at the end of this second round, the guy that's paired up with uh, Josh Allen on the off chance that he ends up panning out. And I think there's a decent chance he does eventually as like a wide receiver three for fantasy. 
Awesome. Craig, looking at who's left over, is there anybody who you're surprised is sitting out there after two rounds? Uh, let's see. So, like, in a one quarterback league, I'm not surprised that none of the other quarterbacks went. I mean, you could, like, some people make a case that maybe you should take, like, Malik Willis or somebody like that. But, like, you're just banking on ups. Like, you're just hoping for upside at that point. But, like I mentioned, I don't want to sit around on this dude for two years and figure out if he's any good. I think, let me go look at my rankings once again. Uh, let's see. I don't think there's any like big ones because like some of these other guys, like a wide receivers, they were second round guys in real life, but like Wondell Robinson, Tyquan Thornton, like they were kind of surprises that they went in the second round too. I probably have Tyquan Thornton a little bit higher in my rankings than most people, just because I think there is the upside there. Like obviously he did produce some at Baylor. People kind of underrate him and it'll be interesting to see what the Patriots do with him. Obviously, they tried to bring in Nelson Aguilar for that deep throw last year, and that just didn't happen for whatever reason. So, obviously, they brought in another guy to try to replace in that aspect, take a little bit of pressure. I know Mac Jones doesn't have the strongest arm in the world, but there's still some upside there. There's a lot of guys remaining that I still like taking shots on, but like once I get past like the top nine, ten guys, I don't have value to the picks too much this year overall anyways. Ryan, one guy. Who should have been picked? Who is it? Uh, uh, Brian Brock's Brian Brock's 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 I like him. He's an Alabama guy. Yes, he is. But this is... All right, buddy. You went, you went robot on us again. That's all right. I'll talk about him. Ryan loves Alabama. He loves Alabama like a fat kid loves cookies. Um, so if there is somebody from Alabama on the board... Ryan loves him. That's facts. <laughs> Except for John Mechie. Except for John Mechie. No, John you Mechie, like John just, Mechie. I, I do like John Mechie. I'm high on John Mechie, but I just there is a player ahead of him on my board, so I took him. Uh, but the thing about Robinson is his landing spot is actually kind of underrated because, you, you know, Antonio Gibson – he hasn't really taken that next step. I don't know if they're going to really want to pay him when his contract is up. And Brian Robinson is, I think he's a stronger runner than Gibson. He might not have the same upside, but there's just something missing from Gibson's game and he hasn't really taken that next step. So if Robinson goes in there and he can be productive, him and JD McKissick would be a nice little one, two combo in a backfield going forward. All right. Well, Gentlemen, Ronnie, it is time for you to take over. Yeah, let's do, do it. For the Aaron Donald jersey. This is very exciting. I oh. might have, in an alternate dimension, snuck my name in like 50 times because I really want It's an authentic autograph on an Aaron Donald jersey who just won the Super Bowl and who is the best player in football over the last 22 years, not named Tom Brady. And I would argue that he's more talented than Tom Brady from a football perspective. Tom Brady's just the dude. And uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. I'm going to hop over to these things so we don't get sucked into the matrix here real quick. All right. So got Aaron Donald on there. I can't see what I'm sharing right now. <laughs> yep. Aaron Donald's up there right now. All right. So no, don't ignore this. If you comment, too late. Too late. But you guys might remember this from the shows we did this weekend. If you caught those, we threw this up there every 10 minutes, reminding people to comment to enter to win. Aaron Donald autographed jersey giveaway. This is randomlist.com. It's just a random website that I found that lets you go in and throw in a bunch of stuff and uh, randomize it. Here's a list of all the people with the YouTube comments, the Reddit users. There's a bunch of people in here that got multiple entries, which was really smart of them. You guys want to give it like a five second countdown? <laughs> I'm just kidding. Let's go ahead and do this. So, Aaron Donald jersey giveaway is going to three, two, one, go. YouTube, Aaron C. Congratulations, Woo! bro. Um, Aaron had a couple really great comments on the second day and the third day. He asked some pretty poignant things about players going in the draft that we were talking about. I remember you specifically. So I'll shoot you a message on YouTube. We'll get your um, get your address and all that stuff, and we'll get this shipped over to you. Congrats, man. 
Wow, congratulations, Aaron C on wearing the Aaron winning the Aaron D jer, jer, uh, jersey. Whoa, there's the Matrix. That was trippy as hell. <laughs> that was Doctor Strange stuff right there. <laughs> now you're going to see that tomorrow. Uh, I gentlemen, am. it is time for tags. That's where we tell the riders where they can find us at any final thoughts. Craig. Yeah, so thank you guys for having me on once again. It's kind of last minute. I know Dave reached out to me, so shout out to him as well. He's a very, very good guy. But you can find me on Twitter at Coach Craig Sport. You can find me on YouTube at Coach Craig Sports. Kind of already talked about the MLB DFS over there. Draft grade videos coming out. There'll be another one tonight for the NFC North. Then tomorrow will be the NFC South. I had to think off the top of my head which one it was. And then, obviously, you can find me at True North. Uh, Rain some football content over there when we get kicking back up again. And then on WeBetATS.com, doing the MLB DFS cheat sheet. I'll I'll write a little bit of NBA content there during the season as well. And then, God, I got to think of everything else. Uh, Patreon.com slash Coach Craig Sports. That's where <laughs> I, I'm going to have my uh, fantasy football rookie rankings, obviously. I am I go through and I grade pretty much all the prospects, too. I was really behind this year. I had a bunch of other things going on, but I had it for last year as well. So if people are interested in that, I do what's I call it snap count spreadsheets. So week to week, every single team, like offense and defense, each player, like how much percent of the snaps they play each week. So I don't know of anybody else that does like this, where you can find it all in one thing. Like you can go to pro football reference and you can look up Elijah Moore and it'll show you like all his by week, but this shows you the whole team comparatively. So like if one guy went down and the other guy went up, you can see it all easily in one spreadsheet. And then last year I did what I call match like a matchup sheet to uh, probably simplify that a little bit more. So it's less work for me this season. So if you're interested in that, and then you can also check me out on the stacks app at coach Craig sport Two. The stacks app is just pretty much an app. Like you can kind of say like TikTok, but not really, but it's um, you go on there, you make a video about a discussion point. So like I made one today, like how does Hollywood Brown going to the Falcons affect them financially for the future? So, because obviously they're going to pay Kyler Murray, they're going to pay Hollywood Brown. You still got DeAndre Hopkins under your contract. You can get out of that, like I mentioned earlier, you know, for save $8 million next year, but it's probably going to be the year after that. Zach Ertz is $10 million in dead money. So like there's all these things and how's that going to affect them going forward? But you can do anything like that. Uh, one of my buddies made one that's like losers of the draft and people can just respond in video form up to 30 seconds. So it's pretty cool app. Uh, lots of different people there to chat with. Fantastic stuff. Ronnie. Um, I got my two things here in my little video description of my name, whatever that's called. Uh, it's at Ronnie A. Evans on Twitter. And then I'm on Reddit all the time. User Mr. Underscore Football. Also, my YouTube page is Mr. Underscore Football. It's audacious of me because I uh, didn't play in college or pro. But <laughs> I love football. And also, I'm on the Chop Shop once twice a week here over at gridiron ratings we kind of cover a little bit of everything and we're going to be bringing in nathan janky from uh, pff here we're going to have gary davenport it sounds like from now football guys formerly uh fantasy sharks he just announced today switching over had mike Wright on a show a long time ago and i think i'm going to be able to pull him back in so we'll we'll see who we can get guest wise but probably a lot of like mock drafts and idp talk and dynasty like overall talk there over on the chop shop so all the gridiron rating shows are on this youtube channel down below all the playlists all the content you guys should check it all out and then uh, i'm there on the chop shop great great stuff ryan well, thanks for having me on, JJ. This is a whole hell of a lot of fun. You can find me on Twitter at the Debbie Dirtbag, as well as at my YouTube channel, the Debbie Dirtbag. And again, I have a three-part series breaking down all of the relevant rookies you need for your dynasty squads. Find out, uh, take the best players for yourself before your league mates even realize they're gone. And last, Don. I'm here. You can find me here. This is where I live. <laughs> Quite literally, it's your basement. Um, <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, special thanks to Coach Craig for joining us tonight on such short notice. I appreciate it. Thank you, Dave Heilman, for helping me uh, hook up with Craig. I appreciate that. Thank you, Ryan, Ronnie, and Don for joining me as always. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at JJ Wenner. Be sure to check out Gridiron Ratings Draft Guide. It's available at our site, gridironratings.com. Check out 
Getting Defensive tomorrow night at 8 p.m., where we talk about the second round IDP rookies and their landing spots. And tune in next week when we look at the late round rookies. Who are the day three and UDFAs to keep on your deep dynasty radar? From all of us to all of you, be safe, be well, and as always, boat drinks, my friends, boat drinks. <laughs>